Hi, you guys. Welcome back to Black Girl Can't Cook. Today, I am joined with one of my dearest, dearest friends. She's an artist, a singer, a songwriter, and just an overall beautiful human being, Victoria. Hello. <laughs> I'm so happy little, to do this. Little baby claps. Um, <laughs> how are you? Happy Sunday. How happy are you? Happy Sunday. I'm good. I'm chilling. Good. <laughs> and all of this sunlight that I can get right now. Oh my goodness. You guys, we had sun in New York, sis. Same. I woke up. I was like, I need to get the F out. <laughs> Cause it was just oh so, God. when the sun's oh out, it feels so good. And this has been like a real winter winter. I feel like. It's been intense. I did not anticipate any of this. No. I like, I feel like last year it snowed twice in total. And I'm like, what are you happening? Right. It's wild. It's wild. Even my boyfriend, he's like, yeah, this is your first winter. I'm like, I've been here six years. I'm like, what? I'm like, I've been here six years. All of my Uggs were ruined year one. Oh no. <laughs> I've like seen snow, but you're right. This is just such a different winter and ugh, yeah. it's so good to have the sun out. Um, how's your February? How's your black history month going? Oh my gosh. It's been going really well, actually. I feel like because of 2020 and like mm -hmm. everyone sort of need to be more aware for the most part, like this year specifically has felt so like more empowering and enlightening, Absolutely. even with people just around me, mm -hmm. like I'll have conversations mm -hmm. with people that'll, that'll tell me that they learn more like facts about, um, black, like politicians or black, like historians and all these people that they never even really like thought That's about or like thing. learned about. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden they have the need to just like research and like, they're excited to know more. Yeah, and it's I so cute. Like having these conversations. It's, <laughs> it's so amazing. It's like um, a higher state of conscious too. It's like totally. people kind of showing up and yeah. I, I'm like an optimist and I'm hopeful. I think that'll just continue to happen because of 2020. I don't think mm -hmm. like in years past, you know, Oh, it's just black history month. Then it's over. Like I really, right. think this is going to be just conversation, especially, Oh my God, I heard the George Floyd trial start starting. So mm -hmm. I really hope we keep having these conversations. And two, for me, it's so great, even as a black woman, just to keep learning, to learn Definitely. about our history and our people. And you just like get a good sense of self. And then two, sending it, I send it all to my friends. Like if I learn something oh. new, then I just send it around. Cause I'm like, I love that. I don't know about this and that. And it's just very, very cool. <laughs> Agreed. It's been, yeah, it's been very, I don't know, evolutionary. I feel like we're finally stepping into history that we didn't even give much thought to. And it's exactly. really nice to do it together. Exactly. Wait, so Vic, we are both, we're both West Coast girls. Yes. <laughs> um, where were you born and raised? So I'm from California, mm -hmm. um, born and raised in technically Corona, which is like Inland Empire. Um, oh. But I spent most of my time in like Orange County, mm -hmm. which is closer to LA. Um, and then I lived in Seattle for a little bit as well before coming Beautiful. to New York. So I've just been all over kind of. <laughs> and where, where have you most felt like home? Where do you think Ooh, home is? Uh, that is a very interesting question. Just after, I mean, because 2020 was a year and I think everyone <laughs> Good God. had to, I, luckily we were able to travel. We had some great joys in our life, but really Definitely. where were you able to find home? Well, you know, Ooh, what's home to you? So I feel like before 2020, mm -hmm. I definitely still felt like California was home. I always just sort of assumed I would end up there. Mm -hmm. um, but recently like with everything that has happened and with the way I've sort of been able to perceive things differently now yeah. um and understand that like things aren't necessarily as like cut and dry as I thought they were um mm -hmm. now I'm sort of seeing California as like a place I'll always want to visit but not necessarily a place that I feel I belong it's heartbreaking yeah. but just like oh. it's so different now and so specifically different. in Orange County it's like full of people that support Trump mm -hmm. and just like people that I don't mm -hmm. share the same views with. And I never thought much of it until this became so important and like and significant and politicized. Um, yeah. And, and important, important because yeah. we're black, we're black women. And right. um, I grew up in Arizona, Chandler and just small town, white Mormon shout out. But like <laughs> you, I, 
always felt like a sense of home. And I moved to New York at 19 mm-hmm. after 2020. And I had to like lose a lot of friendships because of Ugh. white supremacy and DT. Totally. It's just, I will always love Arizona. Even my mom's there and I love to visit, but it's not really like home because I don't, there's people in the surroundings that I grew up with. Like those are not my ideals and my values. And maybe at one time, I mean, you knew me when I was young and I came in New York and (laughs) I had some like ignorant thoughts and thinking and just, (laughs) I'm not, just those environments anymore are not somewhere where I can thrive and they're just not acceptable. So I think it's so- it's so weird. Like you can like go home, but like it not, you don't identify it as home because things have changed and, and to the world's change. And it's really just sad when you grow up in a safe, beautiful community and like you evolve and you grow up, but some people just don't, or they stay stagnant. And they, I like to say a lot of my old white friends, hi, I know you're listening. (laughs) Um, (laughs) They white women like to just stay comfortable and that's, that's okay. They, Free. They have the luxury. They have the luxury of being comfortable and staying small and doing. The privilege. They have the privilege. Um, <sighs> I'm I'm a black woman. I have brothers and I have a mother and a father. And yeah, 2020 was such an eye opening, eye opening, traumatic. I want to say traumatic because being yeah. in a pandemic and every day another black body mm-hmm. murdered. Um, yeah, it just really woke me up. My eyes were waking woken up, and it was just mm-hmm. so shocking that friends and people, they just couldn't see it. So it made it easier. Cause it was, this is such um, uh, an easy, like seeing like mm-hmm. right and wrong and what is, what is racist and what's not. And just for there to be any confusion, I'm like, mm, no, I'm not confused. <laughs> and you can stay home and comfortable, but I, I can't, I, there's no, there's mm-hmm. no way for me to live my life like that. Definitely. Yeah. I, echo all of that because California always sort of felt like the place that I saw myself continuing to evolve like before everything happened I was like I'm going to spend time away and then when I go back that's the place I'm going to settle and continue to grow and now I'm like you know what like I've grown so much more being away and now when I look back and understand how California hasn't grown (laughs) in so many different ways specifically the people within those regions that I mentioned I'm just like there's no way I can find joy like genuine joy and just like contentment by going back and I have to stay here with like and align myself with people that actually care and like continue to try and be anti-racist and like live out those views right Um, it's just and I love you said joy yeah there's there's no way, no way. And two, I don't know about you, for me to like see the evolution and like to grow up and now to now be here. It's just, I just have a lot of like, just love and appreciation because those were friendships and things. I mean, those are our younger years, you know, we grow up and we necessarily don't see the things. I mean, we experience, I don't know about you, but I definitely experienced um, massage noir and little microaggressions, but of course, how to be like a grown, like 26 year old woman, it just mm-hmm. hits differently. It hits differently. And totally. the fact that there's still like nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah, there's no place I can't take, I can't be joy or be comfortable. I can't be myself in a place like that. Ugh. So it's mm-hmm. just, I feel okay about it. And I just have a lot of love because I still have family there. And yeah. I know at a, as a whole, what Arizona will always mean to me and probably the same for you for California. Definitely. Do you think you see yourself staying in New York then? Oh my God, New York or nowhere. Let's get that on the record. New York or nowhere. I do like taking, I'm like West Coast girl. And a lot of my friends out here are from Seattle and stuff, but, um, I love New York. You talk about Seattle. How is doing Seattle and the college art scene and how did you thrive out there? So that's also a really interesting, um, topic only because, sorry, I moved to Seattle immediately after living in California. Mm -hmm. Um, So up until that point, I didn't necessarily feel as aware of like my skin or just Mm -hmm. like aware of any of these things that are constantly on my mind now. But um, so when I first arrived, like obviously everyone around me was white, just like in general, that was the setting. Uh And it didn't like phase me. It never phased me. Um, 
But now when I go back, I'm so hyper aware of like yeah. all of my surroundings at all times, even though Seattle itself is really liberal. Um, and like everyone there is very outspoken about like wanting to be anti-racist and wanting to evolve and grow and everything. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't change the demographics. It does um, not. So that's been super interesting. Just like going back to visit in general. I'm like, where are the people of color? <laughs> like New York is just constantly like whenever I'm here, I'm constantly surrounded by so many different nationalities so many. and ethnicities and everything. And so to go back West, and not experience that even yeah. just like for a week if I'm visiting like it's been yeah. so mind-blowing um crazy but at the time while I was still living there it was actually a really great experience um I met a ton of incredible people wow. um the theater scene was actually great um I I don't know. When I first moved here, I was like sort of clinging to Seattle in my mind. Of course. I, uh -huh. like, I loved it so much. Mm -hmm. By the time I left, I was like, oh my gosh, like, was that actually home? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, like, I know in the same way that I felt like if I were to leave New York, I would still hold on to the same people that I have here, like forever. Of course. I still feel that way with like the majority of my Seattle friends. And so even though I'm not living there and probably will never go back in like a real way <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I still have like held on to everything that I of needed from Seattle which mm -hmm. has been really nice that's so interesting I love what you said I about be, just being hyper aware in those whiteness areas mm -hmm. too because even if I go home and I'll go to like Scottsdale or yeah. um Phoenix Paradise Valley it's just yeah once you're a New Yorker or I remember when I came I moved to New York I was 19 and I went to the yeah. Nordstrom Rack downtown Brooklyn <laughs> Fulton Street and I walked in and girl, I almost like started compulsing. Everyone in the store was black. <laughs> Everyone in the store was black. You guys, even the employees, the manager, oh, everyone was black. Dream. I was just like, this is, I, I was, I was shook. And, and that's the great thing about New York. You're just surrounded by so many different, beautiful ethnicities and now when I, now when I go back home, I'm just, I'm so aware or just really um I'm just like where are the black people I will right. just and it's really funny to like if I go to like weddings of friends I'm like oh I'm still your only black friend good, yikes, good. Yikes. good to know so that's just so interesting and I wonder um if anything I really hope 2020 has evoked just people to get more black friends or I don't know For try real. to try to just get, expand your circle. How about that? Yeah. Just expand your yeah. circle. Yeah. And yeah. I love that. The cool thing about New York too, I'm sure a lot of your friends from Seattle came to New York, right? Or friends from California. There's just so many yeah. different people and connections and mm -hmm. it's just such a great city, you know? That's, totally. I feel like, yeah, that's a good point. I was going to say the cool thing about big cities in general is that you typically will run into somebody that you've known from the past but New York specifically has so many people coming and going like when I the first hub. moved here I probably knew like 15 people that already <laughs> lived here just from like high school and like junior high and I was just like this is that crazy is so amazing like, yeah it has that element of home no matter what which is really special that's so amazing and how yeah. artistically did you grow from so you left Seattle and you came to New York yeah how was that like jump? What did, what did, did yeah. you grow? What did you learn about yourself? And so, your ooh, so that was a thing too. When I was still in Seattle, I was mainly focused on theater, mm -hmm. even though at that point I knew that I wanted to just focus on music. Um, but I had always done theater. So that mm -hmm. was like the easier route. Um, and I had like all of these notions in my mind when I first got to Seattle that like the music scene was something that it wasn't like yeah. I was just sort of conditioned to believe that like what I was going into was something completely different than what it was <laughs> just because the people that would tell me about Seattle are people that knew Seattle in like the 80s <laughs> um so they were just like like they would just tell me all of these things that weren't necessarily relevant by the time I of actually course. came on scene um so it felt a lot more easier to sort of just like step into the theater world there. Yeah. Um, so that's what I did for the like two and a half years that I was there. Um, but then when I moved here, I sort of had this like awakening of sorts again, where I was just like, I've been neglecting what I want to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, 
And also like coming here where it's like Broadway Central, like everyone moves here specifically. Oh my God. Specifically. To theater, to an right? actor. Mm-hmm. And like in moving here, I was like, I feel in my bones that that's not like my calling. It's yeah. not necessarily what I want. Like, I don't want to trap myself again if I were mm-hmm. to sort of try to like get into that world. Absolutely. And make that my be all end all, mm-hmm. then I would continue to sort of like step away from my calling. Mm-hmm. Um, so in moving here, I sort of like made myself prioritize music and I've just been like writing and producing a lot more stuff than I had ever done before. Oh my God. Um, so that's been really great. It's been. That's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And how did you like learn to listen to that gut of just, you know, okay, I did theater and maybe <clears throat> you had friends or you had peers that were succeeding and getting jobs, but how did you just know to trust your gut? Like, mm, but that's- yeah, I think in seeing my friends, cause I do have like, I have a lot, but if you no, you do, Broadway, I do. When we first um, became friends too. Yeah. You'd have friends getting these jobs and be like, she's on girls. And this is, I'd be like, oh, shit, Beth, who you? I was like, who, you know, I'm like, these are real. <laughs> like, I was like, I was like, you have a network of like peers, like yeah. doing it, and you're doing it too. It, yeah. I know? think, yeah. I think because I saw these specific people in my life that had always sort of like had their calling Mm. Um, and they actually went after it and like in seeing that like whether it was people that did like film and tv or people that were on broadway Mm -hmm. like knowing that they stayed true to what it was that they wanted made me want to stay true um to what i always felt like i was supposed to be doing as well um and i remember my first month being here my boss uh who was your boss? <laughs> Hi, Cheryl, shut up. <laughs> oh my gosh. But she approached me and she was just like, hey, like, would you want to do a three hour set of your original music? And I was so like anxious by the idea because I had never done anything like that. Like I had only ever performed theater. I had never yeah. done my own thing. Um, so at first I like almost said no. Cause I was just like, I've never done a set of like my own stuff. Oh my God. Um, but then I was like, you know what? Like maybe this is a sign that I'm supposed to start like actually performing my music and like, mm-hmm. I need to buckle down and like actually take this head on. Um, so in doing that, that sort of like reaffirmed my like inkling that I was supposed to listen to what I wanted to oh be my doing. God. Um, Cause I was just like, how random of an opportunity to just like be able to perform all of my stuff what? and the universe that's so in. crazy and it the universe that's the universe does not like works like that only to give you the things you want and so beautifully like I love what you said you just people that you have admired or look up to they've always just stuck to their own thing like regardless of what others were doing and I feel like it's so hard too as young women and being in mm-hmm. the arts and being creative and being people 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 people, person, people, whatever, being people who love people and have friends and connections. (laughs) It can be, we're human beings. So it can be so hard not to like compare whatever, but just following your own like gut and intuition. That's like the best thing you can do for you. It pays off off every time. And two, I've had to really learn like my journey is like, for me, it's not supposed to, Oh, like I love my friends and my besties but like my journey is not going to look like theirs and Mm -hmm. my road will be my own. And I bet that was so affirming. I do remember you had that set and it was like your own music. And then you had other things after that happened. And it was just like, so how the doors kind of open. I think once you, you know what you want and you just like kind of step into your worth, even though, you know, if you don't know the outcomes, if it's going to work out, you just kind of step into it. That's so, so cool. Oh my goodness trusting your instincts and just yeah exactly stepping into your worth it's exhilarating (laughs) um so growing up how did your environment um affect the way you know you saw yourself and your idea of being a girl and a child how did your environment affect that so growing up specifically um I think subconsciously Mm -hmm. race specifically had always like played a part um in how I saw myself Mm -hmm. just because like we had said like we both were on the west coast and so honestly yeah like I can't even remember a time 
before New York where I wasn't like one of maybe two black people in like my classes or like one of two black people in whatever setting I found myself in. Um, So even though I didn't necessarily think much of like my being like a woman, it was very much me just like thinking about how I'm different from everyone else. Mm -hmm. Um, And for a while I like wasn't necessarily like again, I wasn't hyper aware of all of that in the way that I am now, Mm -hmm. but, um, I just sort of always like acknowledged the fact that I would never look like my peers or I would never necessarily Mm -hmm. have the same, like, I don't want to say upbringing, but basically upbringing. Like Mm -hmm. I always was subconsciously aware that like the life I'm living is going to be different than the life y'all are living, Mm -hmm. even just with like, dealing with police officers or like dealing yeah. with these little like subtle things subtle that things that absolutely subtle. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in that respect it was sort of uh, I don't even know it was like it was almost just this small thought that was always like in the back <clears throat> sorry back of my mind mm-hmm. but never it never consumed me in any real way all of my yeah. friends were white all of my like all mm-hmm. of the all like everything I knew was so white yeah, yeah, same. I can absolutely yeah. relate to you. No, same. And yeah. same what you were saying, it was never, I think race was definitely like in the back of my mind. And even I had grew up with two brothers. So mm-hmm. my grandpa and my dad, my grandpa, and my father talking to my brothers about the police and certain right. things. But like, I was never aware of it just because it was like, this is the norm. Mm -hmm. I probably, I did think it was odd that there was like only like only me and two, one other black girl. And we were like the only two of like our whole class, like really from fifth grade to graduating. And then I do remember like when another black girl would come and she'd be from like Chicago or from somewhere else, just we could, she couldn't relate to me because I was just so in like a whiteness fog, a mm, Avril Lavigne, a little um, Paramore, <laughs> uh, Lizzie McGuire, Amanda Fine. Oh my God. I was really yes. in it and just like unaware of it because that's just how I grew up and right. how I was that's raised. All you and knew. That's all, all you knew. I knew. Mm-hmm. And um, so then it was really hard to relate to like the other black girls that would transfer in and come in. And it was so, but I was so unaware of it. And it's so interesting mm-hmm. how like we grew up I kind of got what you said too. Like I knew that my life would be different because I've I've heard the whole thing. Well, I'm going to have to work twice as hard as my bestie Kelly. Like things are going to be easier for her than for me. Like that's okay. But just, you're going to, I've heard those things, but it was such like a unsubconscious, but it's so interesting. Like how the role does play like on us, like women psycho, like deep, like maybe on an unsubconscious level Mm -hmm. and then just not, I think too, and I didn't just feel like enough. I felt like just being so odd man out and that like I, something yes. was missing. Mm-hmm. So that was just so interesting to grow up in. But still, I think I grew up with a strong mother, strong, oh. strong parental environment. And so it was a lot of like enforcing, you know, you are beautiful, da, 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 don't. Oh. But just like when you're in, I think when you grow up in a white environment and you don't see yourself and then you don't see yourself in media, it's right. really a mind fuck. It's, yes, girl. it's a mind fuck. <laughs> Completely. There's no other way to say it. It's a mind Ugh. fuck. Um, it's wild how, even though it is so startling and like tough at the same time, because you and I were so immersed in these types of environments, we just got used to them for so long Yeah. until we came here specifically or like, out, like once we stepped outside of that world, then it was like, holy, like there are so many different cultures and like so many different things that I haven't even been interested in. And I remember it was as easy for like, um, and I did have the ethnic friends that I had. Well, they were all like white girl friends. And I had like a couple, two Spanish girlfriends who I love, but I remember specifically they moved, I think sophomore year in high school and they moved to like California and they were just like, wow, you like, I grew up in Chandler. They're like, you, we, you live in a bubble. Like everyone is like kind of drinking the Kool-Aid. And <laughs> I didn't really get, I was like, I, I didn't pay any mind. Cause I was just, right. I cared about the hierarchy and volleyball and the status quo. <laughs> um, did not care. But then <laughs> seriously, like, and you're, and I'm 15, like, I don't care. Of course. Right. You moved, but you're absolutely <laughs> right. Like in leaving those place that are home, 
it was just so it was like a culture shock in the best way and just like in a magnified way because I hadn't seen anything yeah. before you hadn't seen anything before and Thank two you. I felt like a real sense of coming home just to see like oh, the black yes. women in New York and like the hair and the fashion and just to see like Same. the everyday people it was I was like there's a whole other world here and there's I was like there's a whole other world outside my hometown I was like shit <laughs> I, I like I could not believe it I could not oh believe God. it and I will yeah. say like everyone says it's so hard to move in New York I I didn't go home the first year I moved here at 19 and Whoa. when you're moving it's hard because like you don't know anyone blah 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 unless you come out of college whatever I didn't know anyone and I really wanted to give myself the year because I knew if I went home I would just get comfortable uh, get comfortable and it's so I don't know it's so easy to like be in the comfort place but mm -hmm. there's nothing challenging happened and like nothing you yeah, can't like so. grow you can't grow and I just saw so much more of my life for myself like I didn't see myself staying home at the same hometown with the same friends mm -hmm. doing the same shit at TGI Fridays bitch get the fuck out there's a million <laughs> other restaurants like no 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 TGI Fridays <laughs> Oh, I, no. I just, no. I just was like, this is not for me. And yeah, I, I'm just so happy I came to New York and I was able to find, um, my black community and community yes, yeah, uh, yeah, and community, the importance of community. Um, what's some black joy though, that's been happening in your life. It's been a hell of a ooh, 2020 uh, joyful yes. things have been happening now. So the main one that I keep just like talking about all the time is that I'm finally an aunt. And so I have a cute little niece now who is the cutest thing in the entire world. She is eight months. Oh um, so just like going through that with my sister was just like a whirlwind. Cause one, we stepped into this journey of her being like super excited, wanting to be a mom, but also being very aware that like New Jersey specifically where she was gonna give birth is the place that has the highest mortality rate for black women dying in mm -hmm. childhood. Mm -hmm. And so like having both of those play out at the same time where like she wanted to give in to the joy of it all, but also she like couldn't let go of the fact that like something that should be so exciting was so frightening, of like course. every step of the way. Of um, so that was wild. Cause it was just like, it was very anxiety filled while also like, very joyful and um, was it encouraging to see your sister's strength and her kind of like obviously rise to the occasion she gave yes. a beautiful girl but was that oh was gosh. that seeing it oh my goodness yeah it was it was very inspiring um but it also was very enlightening I keep using that word but just like seeing somebody I know specifically going through everything while knowing the statistics was just like I don't even know what word to use I can't even articulate that experience but it was just it was so like irksome <laughs> just yeah. because I knew what like the possible outcomes could be of and she course. knew what the possible outcomes could be. Um, so obviously like the fact that she was fine and like lived through all of it was yeah. incredible. But and, like and the a fact miracle. that you would have to worry is like the shitty it's, thing. It's so fucked up. It is right. so beyond fucked up i will add some statistics down at the show notes um yeah black women and i'm kind of like in my mode okay i'll be like 40 and i'll have like five babies but like <laughs> i would want in my head a home birth but oh but also i now i'm hearing like that's almost safer because yes the hospital but that's like terrifying i want to be look at me I no I want to be with doctors and people but then it's like wait right. these doctors are actually murdering black women it's like oh. the weirdest no it's it's awful it's it's really as a black girl as a black woman it's really um it's just frightening and there's no other way to put it and so too I don't know about you when I see I was so happy you become an auntie and you were able to <laughs> you were able to like see your sister right because I know COVID yeah. and precautions that's so amazing yeah. you're able to see her um but that's why too whenever I see a black woman pregnant I just I I'm just so happy and I just pray, <sighs> pray for her I'm like oh god bless because black babies being born is a miracle. It's a miracle period. It's a miracle and it should be celebrated. It really should be celebrated. And it's, it's just, it's really just, if anything, it's devastatingly sad that, yeah, it's that, it's like that paradox. You want to be so happy and all this, right. but 
you know, black women are really hurt by the hands of doctors and Mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it's kind of odd, but that's so wonderful that you got to experience that and you got to see that I'm sure. Yes. It was just so interesting to see and experience. (laughs) Yeah, it was really incredible. Um, Cause like you said before, I was able to take time off of work to quarantine beforehand. And like the good thing, quote unquote, good thing was that I had COVID months before she gave birth. So I had antibodies. So like going amazing, right? Like I was like, at least I know I have antibodies. I can quarantine the full like 14 days before I even exactly. go to her. I don't have to worry about like infecting her. Yes. But, that's so amazing. Right. So and yeah, cause it, we did, were your parents able to come? No, my parents yeah. didn't see my oh, sister at all while she was pregnant and they have yet to meet the baby just cause they're in California and COVID's oh, prevented like all of that, which is heartbreaking. Of um, course. Yeah. And that's, so that's, that's so amazing that you were able to like be there be there for her that's so right. so amazing um another what was gift New York gave me <laughs> another gift <laughs> um what did your sister you know teach you about um your body and how to like love yourself what did other things you learn from question. her I've always I've I always learned like... a sister I'm so envious and oh you guys gosh. Victoria's sister is so cool she's like this tall hot stallion Scorpio. and she's a Scorpio <laughs> yeah. and like I'm just like Victoria your sister let me be friends. she's just <laughs> My yes. Um, what was it like growing up and what, what are some lessons she taught you? So uh, let's think. So she and I, we have a four year age difference. Mm-hmm. And so for a really long time, we weren't in school together. We would have like, um, a, like a short period of time where we were in elementary together. But then after that, it was sort of like, I was always the mm-hmm. one looking up to her, obviously, but, um, she was always like far ahead so that I, was just like constantly influenced by her in general. Mm -hmm. Um, And she definitely like had this like evolving relationship with her body. Mm -hmm. And so I would like, I would view it and sort of take the lessons that she would learn from herself Mm -hmm. um, and sort of apply it to myself. Like even with diet culture and whatever else, like at first she was like any other child and like Mm -hmm. um, she took on certain things absolutely um Mm -hmm. and so seeing that but then seeing how she would still be just as happy when she wasn't so wrapped up in like body everything just like letting herself sort of step outside of it and just be was really influential for me because I was just like yes I've seen her go down all of these different journeys and different roads where Mm -hmm. like she's trying the new fads and doing Mm -hmm. whatever else but like no matter what she does, she always yeah. finds herself in herself without like being so consumed by things that like oh, media tells us we should be consumed by. And so that's sort of what I always like held on to because I was just like, no matter what, I need to be happy with me. Like no matter what that looks like, I am going to be happy with me. Um, and so, yeah, I think I didn't even truly think about that until now, that that's been like the biggest lesson and the biggest just like helpful thing that I took away from watching her grow up Um, that is so beautiful and two to see because I think um so much of growing up you know we we kind of we mirror we mock what we see and our moms and our sisters we look up to them and so that's so beautiful that you took that little thing because you know we're all human and we all bitch we all grew up in America we all have (laughs) <laughs> been brainwashed and programmed for real <laughs> and um it's so beautiful that you were able still to see her come back to herself and still be in acceptance I think that yes. is just so that's huge that's amazing that's huge. um what any lessons your mom taught you I feel like it's sort of the same because they would parallel their journeys because when my sister was growing up my mom would sort of um bring up these different like diets or whatever and it wasn't necessarily like forced upon my sister. Mm-hmm. Um, but it would be like, oh, my mom is looking into like Atkins or my mom's looking into like Slim Fast or like whatever mm-hmm. it was at the time. Um, and then my sister would join in. And so they would sort of go down the same road of like doing whatever they felt like they maybe should be doing because of what they were told from outside mm-hmm. nonsense. Um, but then like having the just like the knowledge that 
this doesn't have to be the be all end all and they don't mm. have to like be so wrapped up in all of this Absolutely. um so yeah it was very similar we're just like seeing my yeah. mom not need to cling yeah. on to like these random little of course things. these things yeah, yeah absolutely um yeah. and you know as a black artist you are a singer songwriter what's important to you right now um you have a voice you have a platform mm-hmm. um what's what's important yeah echoing back to what we were saying earlier <laughs> i think because before 2020 i wasn't as uh vocal let's yeah. say about racism in general, I sort of just like knew that that topic wasn't received well. Same, um, same. Yeah, and like you and I, I feel have a really similar upbringing in that like we were like very tokenized because we were often like the only black person in whatever setting. Mm-hmm. Um, so before 2020, I was very good about just like brushing things off when I shouldn't have been brushing them off. Same, same, um, same, same. Even yeah. like I can say, even like probably still microaggressions from friends. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> like yeah. still just like, like nothing, like nothing. Mm-hmm. So something clicked in me at the beginning of 2020, even before George Floyd was murdered. Mm-hmm. Um, I finally sort of stepped back into myself and I was just like, here's the deal. Like, I'm not going to put up with any of this anymore. Um, And so if I wasn't being a whole lot, but like necessarily like, let me rephrase this. I would either, initially I was mostly vocal via um, social media, Mm -hmm. share my experiences. And I know that was also a huge thing. Like a lot of people in my life didn't know about like racist experiences that I had underwent. Like, yeah, absolutely. To share these experiences, even though, like on the one hand it's hard because it does feel sort of like trauma porn to like right. bring up these it, for it, it does but, too, yeah right but like at the same time in hearing it they were like awoken like they're just like oh my gosh like I didn't even realize that you went through these things because I never had to think about you going through these things yeah. um and so after a while I decided to channel all of that into my music um and so earlier last year I ended up releasing something um that was all about like anti-racism and my experience and being vocal and standing up and how like white silence is dangerous and everything um and then I donated all of those proceeds to like the NAACP amazing um, and so I want to keep doing stuff like that where like I'm intentionally using my music to spread awareness and like spread messages um that need to be heard rather than just like love songs (laughs) (laughs) nothing's wrong with love songs (laughs) you know Um, absolutely yeah that's so incredible um that's so incredible and I think well let me ask where you're when you shared your experience because I went through that too it was like 2020 it was George Floyd and then it was like the summer and so then I too would share my experience with with my white friends and tell them, well, this has happened. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, your mom saying this comment when I was in seventh grade is so, it really, it's put it in context. Um, Mm -hmm. How did your friends receive that when you told your truth? Because I spoke my truth and my friends that aren't my friends anymore, they heard it and they Uh, just shut their, okay. And they just didn't take anything with it. Um, how was, were your people, yeah. your, were your peers receptive and your, you know, people you grew up with? Cause you were very big. You were very vocal. You posted so much. You were, <laughs> I love that. You, yeah. You really use your social media. And I, if y'all know, I use my social media too, in a different way <laughs> <laughs> to drag some folks. <laughs> I'm dead. Oh my God. But no, I you, lived for all of that. First of all, you Stop. really, <laughs> you brought attention and I, um, how did, how were people receptive? What were things that, oh. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry, not to cut you off. No, no, no. Okay. Um, but I feel like I had very varying sort of responses because on the one hand, I was receiving a lot of messages, even from people that I'm not close to, but just like people that would feel the need to <laughs> reach out and be like, honestly, like I didn't think about any of these things until you brought it to light, and like now I'm like evaluating how I have like 
played a role in white supremacy and how I'm like continuing mm -hmm. to like uplift that unintentionally. Um, so like reading that and hearing that was incredible. Um, but um, I would get messages like that from, again, like from acquaintances and close friends. Mm -hmm. um, and like half of the time they would say these things with like promises to evolve, promises to like continue speaking out, blah, 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 blah. And then like within a month, all of that sort of fizzled like mm -hmm. instantly. Mm -hmm. and, like even with close friends too, I hate to say it, but just like mm -hmm. so many people were giving me all of these like grandiose promises of like how they were going to become this anti-racist figure and like yeah. step into all of this and like hold their family accountable um, and just do any little thing that they could. And not to say that they aren't continuing to like be better and want to be better, but I feel like when people aren't held accountable, it's very easy to step back into your privilege and just sort of like be oblivious again. Absolutely. And so, like, yeah, so watching that shift was really hard because I was just like, here are all these people that like were promising yeah. to like be better. And yet like mm -hmm. if my eyes aren't on them, it's not happening. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember even the, like the black square thing, all my friends, all my totally. ex, all my ex friends that did the black oh. square, they're no longer my friend. Cause it was such a, well, this is the moment we hear you. It was a performative allyship and two to not even take the time just to like, understand. Yeah. Like what is your privilege and what does it mean? And not even that, just to like, see what's happening in humanity. Like right. there's something, you know, what's so funny too. I remember growing up and being with all my white friends, we'd be learning about Martin Luther King and all this stuff. I remember being like, you guys, if this shit was happening, mind you, like it, this was only happened like 30, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. If Jim Crow and the civil rights movement was happening, which it literally is happening now, <laughs> what I, I was like, would we even be friends? Did it, Bitch, I got my answer. Oh, my oh, answer. No, oh, I'm not God. even. <laughs> You're so cute. I love you. No, not in a. I mean, yes, on. No, I feel it. I feel like a it. morning devastating loss. No one talks about friendship losses. They're as equally devastating as like any other type of loss. For real. Um, but, but also just, good riddance. But good, good riddance. riddance. Yeah, and to just to be like, ah, oh, this doesn't even affect. It. It was just. Ugh crazy it was so crazy and yeah I just think yeah we both kind of grew up in this I don't know but I think I grew up privileged I certainly did yeah and I just have to take a step back to like know that what's happening is not right and if just white people or white peers can just see that and and empathize I think all black we just want people to empathize with us for real I think that's it and yeah I really hate that there's such a divide and I hope that, you know, we come together as a country. I really, really do. But I love that you're using your music to bring a message and an awareness. I think that's so important nowadays because I mean, we're in a global pandemic. We're mm. in a huge like movement and if, to like not be talking about what's happening. I think that's a form of privilege too. Like definitely if it's, it's that, that's a form of privilege. And that's so great that you're using your voice and your art. Thank so great. You. Um, we're going to wrap it up, but I have a couple <laughs> more questions. Uh, what does self-love mean to you? Ooh. So tying that into a lot of things. Um, but I feel like self-love means celebrating where I'm at, no matter where I'm at, like, as, like, as someone that's, on a journey of consistently trying to like find myself and find like my joy and just mm -hmm. find everything, like being able to step back and be like, in this moment, I'm still enough. Mm -hmm. um, that's self-love to me. Just like reminding myself that like, no matter what's going on, no matter how I'm feeling, I'm still enough. Um, yeah. yeah. And do you feel like a, a sense of like wholeness? What has, what was like the biggest lesson you learned in 2020 about yourself? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest lesson was that I needed to speak up for what I believed in. Cause even though I felt like I was super transparent beforehand and just like, I would be passionate in the moments that like called for that. I wouldn't necessarily always step into my voice unless I like really felt called to, 
but there were so many moments too, where even if I did feel called to, I would be like, oh, it's not my place. Or like, I know it's not going to be received well, just because like white supremacy makes us feel like we're supposed to be small at all times. At all yeah. times. And so <laughs> being able to like push that aside and be like, no, like I'm going to actually use my voice and uplift my voice and like feel fine doing so. And you should be uplifting my voice if you're not black. Hi, like, Hi. hello. Uh, hello, so, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so just like giving in to that like reality that it it's fine to like uplift myself was probably the biggest lesson mm-hmm. I had ever learned. Cause yeah, I just finally wasn't scared to share things that were hard, tough truths for other people yeah. to swallow. Like, mm-hmm. um, and to your truths, isn't it such a, I felt a sense of wholeness when I was able to, oh, these are my truths. Cause too, I feel like as black okay. women, people want to put stuff on us and like, let us carry oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to care. No, no, yeah. <laughs> I know. I know my truths. These are my yes, truths. Girl. And yeah, it's really something I think about stating it and like the power of like, just putting that into the universe and into like the world and God, it's just, mm-hmm then I think no one can really tell you who you are then. There's like mm-hmm. such a power. Everyone's like, how are you so confident? It's like, I just know myself. Totally. I You're just so know authentically myself. authentically you. <laughs> my favorite. <laughs> I love you. So, so are you. Um, okay, we're going to wrap up. This is like a low-key cooking podcast. Um, oh. You moved into this amazing sick-ass apartment. Oh. What? Okay, What? what's up? Are you cooking? Are you taking out? I know it's been winter. What's been something yes. you've been seeing and doing? So honestly, since moving in, I moved in February Mm -hmm. um, and I've just been more so like looking around the neighborhood and like ordering some places nearby. (laughs) First of all, Home Fright is so close now. Oh my God. I am in love. Shout out Home Fright. Fright. Right. Oh, Nico, we love you. Yes, (laughs) girl. Oh my God. Um, But there are so many like black owned restaurants that are super close by too. So I've honestly just been like diving into all of those things. Um, But I for sure need to start cooking. I am not one to cook nearly that often. (laughs) Um, So you have been very inspiring because I'm just like, this girl, you just like sit on top of it. Good God. I'll cook once a week and I'm like, that's fine. That's it. (laughs) Like like I did my due for the month. Literally. Oh my God. And that's like the beautiful thing about New York, about Brooklyn. That's yeah. There's so many great black owned business and yes, sis go out, go try. And it's, it's winter in New York. It, yeah. Like some nights it's so frigid. I'm like, I don't want to cook a whole ass meal. <laughs> like no, it's so, ugh. and that's no the beauty time. of New York. There's no time. Um, <laughs> Victoria, I love you. Love you I so love much. You. Thank God. you for doing this. Um, where can everyone find you, follow you and tell us what's your latest single that's out right now. So, um, you can find me on Spotify. You can find me, just find me. What did I just say? You can find me um, on any actual platform, music platform um, online. So if you have iTunes, Apple Music, anything, um, I'm on there. Um, but my specific name is my full name. So Victoria Rosser. Um, and my latest single is the one that I actually mentioned earlier that I was giving all my proceeds away mm-hmm. from. Um, but it's called Where We Last Left Off. Um, and it ties into that same sentiment of just like, oh yeah, remembering like, these are things we cared about like six months ago, but then we went silent and just like became oblivious to all of these things because we didn't need to think about the ways they were affecting other people. So just course. like, um, yeah. And that is yeah. so beautiful. <laughs> and to y'all, follow her on IG and look at her reels. Victoria, your reels. Oh God, have me. I'm a hot mess. <laughs> I know, like I miss you like so much, but like your reels have me just I'm like, they got it. You were oh, you, no. you so did improv. I don't know, but I know. Like, I did look you at did. you. You <laughs> did. I'm like her comedic timing. I'm just like, what? Oh my God. Um, Thank you guys for listening to Black Girl Can't Cook and bye.